Welcome to a new edition of the Hit Treat Podcast. Super excited to have my good friend, Chuck Thomas, Chief Metallurgical Engineer from Super Systems, all the way from Cincinnati, Ohio. How's it going, Chuck? Doing very well, Carlos. Doing very so, well. So first, thank you for being here, uh, giving us a little of your time. You, if I'm not wrong, you're the first metallurgical engineer that we actually have on the show. We have been, ha we have had uh, salesmen, we have had technical people, mechanical engineers. Uh, we have had uh, a, a lot of great businessmen, CEOs, presidents. But this is a heat treat podcast, and we're trying to deliver heat treat added value and what's best to have a real uh, metallurgical engineer. So, what, what, what can you tell us about the world of metallurgy uh, on a nutshell? That's what we're going to be uh, speaking today. So, Chuck. Uh, first, uh, I would like you, if, if you could uh, introduce yourself to the audience, who you are. You have a great career on Heat Treat, right? I, I see that you, you, you were in Cummins. You actually uh, were a uh, plant material engineer for Nitrix a couple of years ago, then went to add to Cummins. And right now, you are with Super Systems as Chief Metallurgical Engineer. So if, can you share with us a little bit of your background? Yeah, sure. I'll give you that real quick. And Thank uh, you. Thank you very much for having me on, by the way. You oh, know, you're, you're a star. You're, being the first you're a metal or just, you know, I'll try to set the bar very high. So You will. I'm pretty sure. <laughs> yeah, I started out my career at Cummins, uh, a diesel manuf uh, engine manufacturer, and um, I supported um, a vacuum heat treat operation there. It was a, a small captive, uh, four or five furnaces, and uh, I supported that, worked there for, for several years. And then I went to uh, one of their suppliers. And at the time it was a small heat treat shop just owned by a single family called Alloy Hard Surfacing. And it later was purchased by Nitrex. And you know I spent what's equivalent to the majority of my um, engineering um, you know, working time, I guess, whatever. Uh, I spent that at Nitrex. Um, about 15 years, and then had another short step back at Cummins, um, and then um, Steve found me at, at Super, and I went to Super Systems, and, and I'm still going here, seven years and strong, going strong here at Super Systems. So. Good, and you have helped Super Systems to develop a bunch of stuff, uh, especially on night riding up and see. I know that you also have been involved in uh, in, in projects uh, for, for R&D, especially. And I do believe that it's great to have a metallurgical engineer on a company that uh, the application is not metallurgy itself, but the end user uses metallurgy. So you are actually understanding the needs of, of the customer. Wouldn't you agree with that? Oh, I agree with that 100%, yes. Right, so uh, today we're gonna talk about Metallurgy, of course, it's a very wide subject, mm -hmm. but Chuck being on the industry, being on, on, on the control uh, business, on the furnace business, uh, having seen a bunch of applications such as uh, nitriding, carburizing, uh, LPC, uh, annealing, normalizing, of course, the spectrum is very wide, not only heat treating, there's castings, there's, there's metal forming, there's, uh, so there's a bunch, but today we're gonna, we're gonna ask Chuck, what should be the basic knowledge or the basic courses of metallurgy that are a must if you're in the heat treat business, right? Heat treat is very wide, right? But we're going to try to narrow metallurgy to the essentials. I was telling Chuck before uh, we started the podcast that my background is on industrial engineering. Uh, Destiny brought me to the heat treat industry. And I wanted to ask you, Chuck, what are the essentials that I should know about metallurgy if you were me? And, and you were in charge of a heat treat shop and you were not, you did not have your credentials. Yeah, you know, there's gonna be some basic knowledge that you're just gonna to have to look up. And like you said, that might be via the web and not necessarily from just a book and whatnot, but it's gonna be the, the basic definitions of, of, of heat treatment, you know, hardening and softening and tempering and kneeling, normalizing all those kinds of things. You just least have to understand what those processes mean. You don't have to know the specific temperatures for a given material uh, because you can look that stuff up in a book. 
Um, but you at least have to understand the, the verbiage. And that, and that seems kind of basic to me. Um, and I think anybody who would be getting into that industry um, would want to go in and learn about the industry in that way, right? Um, but, you know, I think my biggest success, and it, it's actually not because I have the metallurgical degree, it's, it's simply been because I'm willing to try things. So you can read a lot out of books and sometimes you'll get people to share some information with you, um, but you gotta be willing to try things out and uh, you gotta be willing to you know, take a risk here and there, not a safety risk, but uh, be willing to try some things and then you learn from that because that seems to be the best way to remember and to truly understand the process uh, in heat treatment. So, you know, for example, my first um, job at Cummins, even though it was a union shop, uh, the operators loved it that I was willing to climb in the furnace every opportunity that it was down and either help them with a dumb task like just cleaning soot or, you know, repairing something, um, you know, all the way down to then helping them with the process setups and that sort of thing. And it made me learn how the equipment work with work better than just standing outside and watching things from the outside. Um, and then that helped me understand the processes better as well, like the limitations of the equipment and how that's going to affect things. So, and I, I believe you you just uh, say something that it's it's worth to uh, discuss a little more. Uh -huh. I believe that the impression that most of the guys have, not everybody, but when we talk about a metallurgical engineer, it's guys being on a lab looking at microscope, microscopes and microstructures sure. and, and trying uh, and looking at charts and trying to, uh, very theoretical, right? Yes. But I also believe that part of the job description is like you stated, going on the shop, crawling to the foreigners, uh, understand uh, the machine that is making the process in a way. So, I also believe that every every job description of, of a plant metallurgical engineer should include that. Would you agree with me? Yeah, I agree 100%. Yeah. That, um, most of, you know, you are right that metallurgy is such a wide field uh, and material science is really the, the degree and, um, and it includes lots of different things that outside of the world of metals, even if you go into other ceramics and polymers and all that stuff. Um, but what has, has made me, like you said, more successful is how hands-on I've been. Because what you will find is that there are still a lot of heat treat shops out there who don't have a degreed metallurgist on site, okay? And, and although the industry and the standards are, are tending to start to go towards requiring that degree. They also accept experience, you know, a certain number of years experience and maybe a, a different degree, a different technical degree, but the experience is everything. Uh, you know, I do go into books and I look at charts and I'll look at structures and I do all that, but I can teach a lab person to do that who has no degree you know, who just has a high school diploma, within six months, I can have that person determine whether parts are good or bad. Um, now, if they get in, they may get into an area where something really goes awry and they produce a structure that no one's ever seen. And then now that might involve my, you know, my input. Um, but most of the challenges you're going to get into aren't specifically metallurgical engineering related. You know, they're, they're just common challenges that everyday, everyday businesses have, and you just have to be willing to be innovative and to deal with those issues and, and figure it out and try new things, that sort of thing, so. I agree 100% with what you stated. Uh, there's a lot of uh, uh, key businesses that uh, they even get the metallurgical recipe from the customer. I mean, they get the spec and they just don't have to uh, process design it. They just, they just follow uh, the variables by the book, right? And they have to be very careful with the tolerances and things like that. But there are very seldom people actually who uh, design the process, right? 
Mm -hmm. uh, most of them follow specifications. Uh, if we're talking about the automotive world or the or the aerospace world, I mean, you get you get the specification from the customer and you follow it, right? And when you have to develop something, which I believe there are some cases, how do you do it? Do you go into books? Do you go into charts? Charts? Do you do you uh, write down your experiences and your uh, your theories, and then you have to go to the furnace and do trial and error until you get uh, uh, the result, the proper results that you wanted. That is, is that the proper procedure? Yeah, you know, there's there are lots of ways to do that, and and nowadays there are more and more tools to try to help us predict what's going to happen. Um, you know, different calculators and that sort of thing, where you know, it, there's all these fancy. Uh, tools out there now, software tools. But the reality is, is, like you said, you know, nature and and all that doesn't read the book. They don't follow it. So you may have something that looks perfect in a software program. You have to go out and try it. Um, and you know, and and we all started that way. So like you said, we would get into a book or get online, find the charts that say, oh, that's this material you run it at this temperature. So you start with that basic principle of how to do that process based on what's been documented already. And then from there, you're gonna tweak that process, maybe based on geometry, and it may be you know, based on some other factors that the requirements that the customer has. Um, but but you, you gotta learn in real time. And, you know, and then that's, those end up becoming what, what people like to call in the industry the tricks, right? And those are the things that aren't published, and those are the things that people keep near and dear to their heart. So, but that's what it's all about. It's it's a trial and error situation. I would call that experience. That's the experience. Yeah. Well, yeah. You, you can find it from books, but it, it's like a, a knowledge that you get being yeah. on the shop and running sure. for this. So, uh, based on what you said, uh, I once came across a situation when there were two identical furnaces uh, running the same part, the same process, but they were getting different results and they had to tweak a furnace a little bit that way and a furnace a little bit this way in order to get the same metallurgical results. Have you experienced something like that? Yeah, um, I have. Um, maybe not exact. I've actually since I've been with Super Systems, I have uh, run into that where customers are having that issue. They might, like you said, have two furnaces that are have been built within a year of each other, mm -hmm. and uh, you know they they technically almost have the same set of prints, really, um, but they're getting slightly different results out of one than the other. Uh, and it wasn't um, it wasn't a situation. It, it was a it was actually a carbonitriding process. It wasn't a situation where the parts were bad out of one furnace and not the other. It just, it, they were different. And that, that man, it's a huge challenge. And, and it's mostly because you can't physically go inside the furnace and watch what's happening. Or, you know, most, most equipment, we don't have uh, load thermocouples that can carry all the way through the process. I mean, there are some, like in vacuum equipment, for example, where parts are loaded and they don't move. They happen to quench in the same location where they were uh, heated up. You can get away with multiple load TCs, which give us a nice indication. But in an atmosphere furnace, most of those require movement uh, during the process at some time, whether it's uh, taking something out, lifting it up and putting it into a quench or whether it's just transferring from one vestibule to another. And in those cases, you have less control. So you, you, you have a lot more variability there of what's different between, uh, you know, furnace A and furnace B. And, and it can be something really small can make a huge difference in those properties. Um, so it, it's, it's the, you know, really the biggest challenge, the biggest problem that you have to solve in heat treating is, is why um, parts, I used to run the parts this way and, you know, now they no longer come out this way when I run it the same way, you know, I didn't change anything. So, so would will, will, will you agree with the statement that the thermocouples, uh, when you're performing a survey on, on, on real part, 
uh, on different, you know, uh, nine thermocouples or 12, 12 thermocouples or across sure. the globe. Are the eyes of the metallurgists inside the furnace? Yeah, well, they're, yeah, they're the at least, yeah, they're, they're at least one side of it, right? Mm -hmm. They're obviously the temperature side of things um, because it does make a big difference. That's why there is a, uh, a tolerance requirement on each type of furnace and each or each type of process really um, because that is the essential um, I guess the sort of the key to getting the part with the right mechanical properties is to get up to a certain heat or to cool within a certain a given amount of time you know it's all about controlled heating and cooling and um, you know you got to get the parts up to a certain temperature, um, and you got to get them down to a certain temperature um, in a controlled manner. And when you know it's it's amazing how one small issue in a furnace heat box can affect the integrity that it'll make one area of the furnace just horrible in terms of a uh, temperature uniformity. Right, and and it's it's very common to have like bad seals on the doors. Yes, and, and and you get the TC on the top, you get the turbo couple on the top, and you're getting uh, soft parts or right. uh, the car parts that are right in the edge on the load mm -hmm. that uh, they have a cold spot. And the only way for you to see it is is running a, a TUS a survey, and and and, and locating that uh, that cold spot. But the control turbo couple and the high limit will be on the top of the furnace, and they will actually be. Uh, working well right sure. so it's uh, as you stated before in the, in the podcast i believe it's very important for a metallurgist to understand how the furnace is functioning and in order to understand uh where a possible failure can be at the furnace that is causing uh, not to get the right metallurgical properties sure that's right okay so we got uh, if, if you had a, a, a bad part let's put the situation we had two furnaces and uh, identical one year from another, same prints, and suddenly you're getting bad parts from one. Uh, the first thing that you do is a TUS, right? And you're trying to analyze the data. What will be like a second, uh, a second approach? Yeah, so for me, for me, then that is the advantage, um, you know, and, and one necessary bit of information that you need to, to have about heat treating is you, you have to know what the causes, the potential root causes of the problem are, right? You're, you may not be able to pinpoint it down to less than, let's say, three or four causes, um, but you have to know. So, for example, if, if you have a retained austenite issue, um, you know, that, that doesn't necessarily mean that you have a temperature uniformity issue, but it could, because you actually could have a hot spot in your furnace. And if you know that a rise in temperature when you quench from a higher temperature, it increases your retained austenite. You know that's a piece of information that you need to know. Um, you know, but if you have retained austenite, you probably don't have a low low spot in your furnace as far as uniformity. For just for example, um, but but you, you know, on the other side of this is the atmosphere, and so we have to know if the parts are bad, uh, and it's based on an atmosphere issue, or or is this like you said? Uh, an issue that's affecting the entire part from the from the center out um, to tell us uh, what the issue is. So that's kind of that's where and you can get all that just from from experience, um, but you have to be able to look at that issue and think, you know, what could be causing this issue? Is this an atmosphere issue? Is it a, a uniformity issue? Um, and and it could be an atmosphere uniformity issue as well, right? So. Uh, there's so many so many layers uh, that you have to go after. It, it kind of makes it tough. I will agree, and I, I will just add to that one uh, a very complex uh, variable and part of the process that is the quenching yeah. process, right? Uh, and and this is my my perspective, Chuck. Don't get me wrong. I tend to believe that the heating process, maintaining temperature. And looking at variables while the furnace is uh, hot and the parts are uh, absorbing heat and we're getting uniform gases and temperature is what metallurgists focus the most. And the quench is the quench process. The quenching process is when transformation takes place. But 
uh, with most of the meteorologists I talk with, uh, they, they tend to talk 80% about the ramping, the heating, the soaking, the diffusion, or uh, KN or uh, you name it, what's uh, the, the uh, soaking or adding carbon or adding nitrites, but they don't, I, I, and this is my impression again, I don't seem to hear as much about the quenching process as I hear of what's going on in the chamber. I don't know if you, you uh, had some comments on that. Uh, I, I tend to agree with that. The um, quenchants tend to be neglected, um, you know, and you'll, it's because we're forced um, through specifications to, to have oil sent out to be tested or have it to be filtered to remove all the junk that's in it. Um, you're kind of forced to do that. And, um, you know, you, you, like you said, you do tend to, you tend to give a lot more care and consideration to the heat box and the mm -hmm. heating elements or the burner tubes and that sort of thing than you do uh, the, the, the quench oil or, you know, whatever that might be, the quench media that you're using. And um, you're right. I mean, it, 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 it's actually just as critical. I mean, you mm -hmm. know, of course, um, because, uh, you know, if you, if you have run into dirty oil or oil that has degraded to a point that it uh, slows its speed, there you go. You got bad parts that way as well. And you got a bunch of uh, oil, uh, not oil, oil, quenching media. You got a bunch of quenching media. You got gases, you got water, you got oil, you got air. Uh, so I believe the, the quenching process is also uh, as important as the heating process. Of course, it's heat treat, not, not quench heat, not, not, not uh, quench treating, right? That's right? And I'll give you an example. There's a bunch of sensors, flow meters, TCs, uh, you know, um, infrareds that are uh, meant for the application to monitor the heat box, mm -hmm. right? And But they're very seldom if you compare those to to uh, the furnace itself to the quench tank. So I, I do believe that we, we have a, a bunch of more, uh, more opportunities in there, but sure. So Chuck, uh, let's, let's go to uh, the second topic that uh, uh, we discussed that are uh, the mistakes you often see on commercial heat treats, right? Mm -hmm. uh, when, when you walk uh, into a commercial heat treat, right? Yep. Uh, because I know that you have been in a bunch of, uh, of, of commercial heat treats. Uh, what are the most common mistakes that you see that can uh, be uh, easily fixed? Yeah, the, the, probably the, <laughs> the, the biggest mistake I see is the lack of money that gets put back into the heat treat. Okay. So, so from know, metallurgy, we went to finances. Good. <laughs> and I, I hate to say that, but you know, most, so it's funny because, you know, I, I, when I worked at Cummins, the floors were literally white there, mm -hmm. you put a special dye into the concrete to make them white. And, and it, it was all vacuum, but it was a very clean heat treat. And so then I went commercial and the, <laughs> The, you know, when you go inside, it, it wasn't quite a dungeon, but it kind of reminded you of that. Mm -hmm. And um, now that I'm at Super Systems, I get to go to lots of different customers, uh, whether they're captive or commercial, I get to go to their sites uh, and I get to see their operation. And that's one of the first things I kind of pay attention to is how much does it look like they're putting back into the operation to maintain the quality? And, you know, some of those you go into and you, you literally think maybe you've entered hell. <laughs> there's so much smoke. There's no ventilation. <laughs> um, the equipment is falling apart. There's exposed wires everywhere. Uh, you know, you can tell that they've, they've put very little back into it. And, and it does affect the quality over time. I mean, mm -hmm. it, it certainly will because this equipment tears itself up. Um, just with, with the heat involved um, or just with the personnel and, and, and banging stuff around and moving sure. stuff and whatever. And, you know, it always seems like these heat treat shops have absolutely no money, um, but they, they always stay in business. So uh, I'm sure they're making some money. 
Um, you know, and then the, the next part that kind of goes with that is the mindset, you know, where quality is not first. Um, you know, they're afraid to, let's say, shut down a furnace in order to fix an issue. Um, they would almost rather band-aid or, or they may have found that they could do a small tweak to the process to fix the issue, but it's really just a temporary fix or it's almost like masking a fix. Um, and they, they don't, uh, don't want to just say, hey, you know, I know production is important, but we also have to have good quality. So, you know, those are a couple of the biggest mistakes that I, I see uh, if I go to a location. But you also have to remember that pretty much my job right now is that I, customers only call me when they're having issues. Right. So, they, you know, they don't call me when things are going great uh, and everybody's happy. So and then, I, and I, next, time, next time I, I got something great to say, I will I'll give you a call, Chuck. Just give say, me a hey, call. Hey, hey Chuck, know, things hey, are we, going great. Just want to say hi. Yeah, I just want you to know. I Yeah, we did this and it was great. <laughs> so if you're listening and you're a customer from Chuck, when things are going great, just give him a call, please. Uh, Thank you. Know. you. Thank yeah, you so much. I, I would love to call customers just to see how they're doing. I get kind of busy, but I do. It's like I... I think I may have helped them, but I'm not sure. Usually if I don't hear back from them, it means that they've either they've either closed their doors or they fixed the issue and they're moving on now. So Good. Uh, that follow-up is nice sometimes. So something that you just stated, and I, I tend to tell my customers the same, is that furnaces are self-destructive machines, yeah. right? You yeah. can have a brand new furnace uh, running smoothly, you know, but if you don't maintain it or uh, you, you don't uh, put spurs back, you don't calibrate burners, you don't clean it, right? It's going to self-destruct. Sure. Why? Because you have, you have temperature, you have fumes, you got oil, you got mechanical friction, uh, you, you get, uh, I mean, you get dust. Uh, so it is, it, it is a hardcore industry, yeah. but that doesn't mean that it has to be a dirty industry. And there's many uh, captive and commercial shops that they do a great, a, a great work yep. cleaning the furnaces, having their, for, the, their floors, uh, you know, aligned, low on, on the relative space. And I'm not even talking about the, the uh, big airspace shops. I mean, there's some very, uh, uh, you know, small size, uh, middle size commercial heat treats, and they don't have to have a state of the art building. But when you go into it and they're aligned, uh, everything is the right place. You see that they're, uh, you know, cleaning the furnaces, maintaining the furnaces, and it doesn't have to be like a super cool like building. But you see, this shop is well managed. But you can also go into shops and see, a, like you stated, like you're entering to hell, right? Yeah. And but uh, and I believe that's the one one of the most common cliches that hatred has that but it doesn't have to be that way. And no, we we know right. many shops that are very professionally run. Right. Oh, I've been into lots of clean shops too, and 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 and, and they're not expensive shops, right? No. I mean, they 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 can run on a budget, of course, making money. Yep. Uh, the furnace is not brand new, maybe twenty five years old. But you can tell that they put money back into the into yeah. the shop. I don't know if you will agree with that one. Oh yeah, I, I agree. Um, when when I left when I left Cummins, we didn't buy a new piece of equipment. You know, uh, I think the first new piece of equipment was a after the company got purchased by Nitrex. It was a Nitrex furnace, but everything prior to that for the first five to six years was used equipment and. It's like you said, it doesn't, it doesn't mean that it's bad equipment and, and things can look old, but they just have to be running and safe and that sort of thing. And, and, and that's really, you know. And, and well-maintained. So I, I once talked to, uh, I, I don't recall the, the, the name of this guy, but he told me something that uh, uh, I remember a lot that said, you know, he, you know, he treat is, is uh, a four is only a box isolated uh, with insulation, uh, with, with heat, it can either be gas or, or electric, right? Mm -hmm. That has been a furnace for the last hundred years. The only thing that has evolved 
is uh, how we control what's yeah. inside that's, that furnace. So true. basically the controls and controls, flow meter, TCs, yep. uh, pretty much, right? Yep. Uh, it, it's not rocket science, but it's how how you track those variables and how you control those. So that's right. is that a first statement? Oh, it's, yeah, it's true. It's the, uh, the, you know, the, the furnace, uh, the first carburizer I installed was a 1954 Ipsen and uh, it ran just great. You put a new heat box inside of it, you know, you brick the inside and, and new burners and it's like a brand new furnace. Uh, so I, I agree with that hundred percent. It's, it's really now it's all about those controls and, and how they've evolved over the years. The, the design of the furnace itself I mean, we've gotten a little smarter, right? There are probably some designs out there, older ones mm -hmm. that weren't real great. Uh, they needed more maintenance, so they needed, you know, more frequently to be addressed in some way. But overall, the the designs are basically solid, you know, um, and it's just if the right materials are used, um, they do very well. Right. So. And what what would you say uh, besides, of course, body? What, what would be like the biggest difference from running, because you've been in both, uh, of, of working on a captive shop and working on a commercial shop? What are like the big difference? Uh, the, the biggest difference is, um, there's probably several, but um, it's just having to be versatile um, the, you know, the captive shop was kind of the same job day in and day out, and it, it was kind of easy. I, mean, I don't mean it that way, but it's you, you're kind of running, let's say, 10 different part numbers and maybe half a dozen materials, and it's almost monotonous. And in a commercial shop, it, uh, you know, where I worked, I had we had, let's say, 10 customers who were giving us weekly work but then we had literally a hundred other customers mm -hmm. who we might only see jobs a couple of times a year but they were always different and it was always something making you think um so it, it almost made it more fun it was more challenging for sure um you know because you either have to try to mix and match jobs or you have to do things and you have to have equipment that's going to be able to handle that kind of stuff uh, but that's, you know, that's kind of the main difference that I saw between the two. Sure. Because uh, when you're running a captive, you're running a bunch of volume, which is also a big responsibility, right? You have to make sure that that production keeps rolling. And, and, and if you detect like a quality failure or something that it won't affect the line. So I, I kind of get that, you know, uh, running mass production, uh, but making sure that this mass production goes well without any quality defects or running a bunch of uh, uh, small projects, but uh, each one has a solution. Right. So that would be like the main difference, right? Great, great talk, great, you know, great conversation we've been having. I, I, I just loved it. So uh, something that, that, that you see early uh, caught, uh, caught my attention, uh, you said that you could teach like a lab guy in six months to, you know, check loads, check quality, microstructure. But how how much will it take you to process the site? How deep will you have to go? Uh, even if you are a metallurgy, because things keep evolving. You know, there's new new materials and new processes. Mm -hmm. How how much do you have to get uh, uh, into it if, if you want to process design something? Let's say uh, an application, because we're talking about uh, us as suppliers for the heat treat market, but have you have any experience uh, process designing like the guys that are uh, with the OEM saying, you know, I need this steel type with this type of process in order to achieve this objective? Yeah, that um, most of that occurred when I was at Cummins. So right, yeah. which is the other side of the spectrum, right? right. Because uh, the, the, the customer has to look forward for the application itself. Correct. And, and um, yeah, we would do that. Now that was, um, so the first time I was at Cummins, I was specifically dealing with heat treat, but I was asked to help, you know, help 
develop those processes to achieve certain properties. Uh, the second time I was at Cummins, I was actually a part of a group where it was all about, let's say, the design of new parts and the failure analysis of, of parts, you know, and then how, what, what we have to change to prevent that. Um, so it's on both sides. Uh, and I've been on both sides, but uh, most of the design side from a commercial, when I was commercial heat treating, you know, most of the time, uh, the customer's already done all that work, mm -hmm. uh, or you're running it for the first time for them and they're testing it out to see how well it goes. Uh, one of the two. It's, it, it's a challenge. Uh, and I, and I tend to ask this to, uh, all the guests and, and, and that we have on the podcast, but if, if you were to give an advice to a guy that, that uh, just got his degree on metallurgy or material science, you name it, right? Yep. And, and he's going to go to, uh, uh, let's say, Cummings or a captive shop. What advice would you uh, give him to him? What would you have liked that somebody would have told you before uh, you took that job in, in, in Cummings and you, you actually learned it uh, through your career? but uh, you had to learn it on the field, not on school. You know, what I found is that uh, the amount of time you actually spend using your degree is a very small percentage um, compared to using common sense and, um, you know, just using, because in, to me, engineering, sure, I, I, I know some things from a metallurgical standpoint that, that you don't know, Carlos, because you were in industrial, right? But we both have a certain mindset of how to approach a problem and then try to find a solution for it. It doesn't mean that we have the solution in our pocket and we're just ready to, to dish it out. Um, it's okay to not know the answer to a question. It's, it's all about, are you willing to try to find the answer to that question and, you know, do it somewhat efficiently, of course. And, and, you know, and that's what the company wants to see. So, you know, that's why I say when I got it out there, it was all, I was kind of embarrassed by how little I knew about heat treating when I got my first job. Although in college, they don't talk much about heat treating. That's almost like the, you know, the, the black sheep of the material science. I, I, I got to stop you right there. So uh, that, 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 that's like a wow moment for, for me. So, So what do they uh, teach you on, on, on metallurgical school? Well, that's the thing. So it's, it's really material science. So it's, it's not that we didn't... Well, material science, but... It's not that they didn't teach me about heat treating. It's just that... That's, I, no, I don't want to put you in the spot, Chuck. There I don't were want to put no you in the heat spot. treating no. classes, okay? So, so right. I, I took a... You know, I would... You know what I focused on my senior year was phase equilibria and thermodynamics mm -hmm. and those types of things. Now you apply those to heat treating and then you, you get from point A to point B, but they don't teach you that you, you know, you core harden 4140 at 1550 Fahrenheit, you know, and that you have to, you know, oil quench it or whatever. But uh, so, you know, when I got in, got out there in the world, there were all these things, all these questions I had and it was a little bit surprising but it's it's like hey you know this degree didn't give you all the answers to the world it, it taught you how to think and sure. how to approach a situation sure. and then how to you know how to solve that so sure but 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 in a nutshell so w which which are like the the classes that uh, I know there's there's not a class called heat treater Beer and girls, that's all it was. Beer and girls, got Beer it. Okay, girls. so that's what you learn, right? <laughs> that, 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 that's, uh, we're going to be on YouTube, so I, I, I won't say anything else, right? Yeah, but, you know, but Chuck, I do believe you're a great metallurgist and uh, you, have, uh, you have had a bunch of experience, theoretical and on the field. And you visited a bunch of uh, commercial heat treat shops. So thank you very much for being on the show. Uh, I, I believe that uh, you do have a passion for the for the industry, for heat treating, and thanks for doing that. You've been a great friend, a great, a great colleague, 
And, you know, I, I wish this is not the, the last time that uh, we speak on, on the podcast. As you, as you mentioned, you know, metallurgy is very wide. Yeah. So we had to narrow it to, oh, that's, yeah. to four minutes. Sorry about that. But uh, this is Chuck Thomas, uh, Chief Metallurgical Process Engineer for Super Systems. So we're uploading a weekly podcast. We're on YouTube, LinkedIn, Spotify. Uh, download it. Chuck, help me go like this. Go like this. Uh, subscribe. Give us a like. And we'll see you next week on the History Podcast.